Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the stability of various cations and how that impacts the rate of SN1 reactions. We're going to be taking a look at different reaction coordinates to understand how cation stability impacts the energy of a transition state, and also looking at things like hyperconjugation and how that impacts the stability of cations based on their substitution. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to go over, and you may have seen this already if you looked at the SN1 reaction overview video, is Hammond's postulate, right? So the transition state energy is what determines the rate of a reaction. So if the transition state has very high energy, that reaction is going to be harder to access because the uh, compound has to reach the transition state before reaching the product energy. And so Hammond's postulate states that for an endothermic reaction, that is one where delta H is positive or we're climbing uphill towards the product energy, the endothermic reaction has a transition state which looks more like the product energy than it does like the reactant energy. In other words, if the product is really high in energy, the transition state must also be high in energy. If the product is lower in energy, the transition state will be lower in energy. In the case of a SN1 reaction, the product of the rate determining step, the first step, is the formation of a carbocation. That is a uh, endothermic process, and so the energy of the transition state is directly related to the energy of the carbocation. A more stable carbocation has a lower transition state energy, and a more unstable carbocation has a higher transition state energy. As a result, cation formation energy, which is the reverse of cation stability, determines the rate of the SN1 reaction. In other words, the rate of the SN1 reaction is going to only be related to the rate constant times the concentration of the um, uh, R leaving group compound. Right? The concentration of the nucleophile will not impact the reaction rate at all. So you also might notice that the, uh, there is an activation barrier for the capture of the nucleophile denoted by Ea2. However, that activation barrier is much, much smaller than it is for the uh, activation barrier of cation formation. As a result, there is only ever one rate determining step in a reaction, and so the cation formation with the larger activation barrier is the rate determining step. Right, cation formation is the rate determining step. So how do we determine which cations are more stable than others? Well, the main thing that we want to consider is the substitution of the cation, i.e. how many things other than hydrogen are bonded to that and or the cationic carbon, or the, in other words, how many things are bonded to the carbon with the leaving group. So a methyl cation or a methyl substituted carbon will have nothing but hydrogen bonded to the carbon with the leaving group. On the opposite end of the spectrum is a tertiary uh, carbon, which has three things, i.e. three carbon-carbon bonds bonded to the carbon with the leaving group. So there are no CH bonds on that resulting cation. Primary and secondary have one or two carbon-carbon bonds, respectively. Methyl cations are extremely unstable, right? A CH3 plus species is extremely unstable, so unstable, in fact, that it is completely not reactive towards SN1, because the cation cannot form. On the other hand, tertiary cations are the most stable. They are going to be the most reactive towards SN1, and that's typically where we do see SN1 reactions. In, in general, substitution increases cation stability. So as you move towards the right here, SN1 reactivity will increase. Somewhere along the middle here, between the primary and secondary cations, there's this imaginary dotted line where on the left-hand side, we do not see SN1 reactions, and on the right, we do. You will never see an SN1 reaction on a methyl or primary cation that does not have additional stabilizing factors like resonance. So a straight up primary carbocation is extremely unstable. It will not go through an SN1 pathway, right? Why is this the case though? Why does substitution lead to greater cation stability and greater SN1 reactivity? Part of it, it has to do with electron density. Carbon has far more electrons than does hydrogen, right? Even though carbon is small, hydrogen only has one electron. It's very non-polarizable. It cannot donate very much electron density. Carbon has a lot more. So you can think of a reverse inductive effect through the single bonds where alkyl groups are sort of quote unquote electron donating. 
Because they are not very electronegative and they have about the same electronegativity as the carbon with the cation, the electron density can be shared a bit more between those single bonds and that helps stabilize the carbocation. There is another factor though which influences the stability of carbocations and it's arguably the more important one and that is known as hyperconjugation. Hyperconjugation is a special sort of resonance between single bonds as opposed to pi bonds. So consider the following orbital diagram. On the left, we have our carbocation, right? It has an empty p orbital and it's in a trigonal planar configuration. On the right, we just have a methyl group with three carbon hydrogen bonds. On one of those bonds, I've gone ahead and drawn the sp3 orbital from the carbon to the hydrogen. This orbital contains the electron pair that forms the sigma bond between the C and the H, right? If you notice, if the methyl group is rotated properly, one of the CH bonds, the one I've drawn in the, uh, the orbital for in this case, will be aligned in a sort of parallel fashion with the uh, P orbital from the carbocation. This results in a special sort of resonance interaction between that sp3ch bond and the carbocation. In fact, what will happen is that you can get this pair to donate itself into that empty orbital. That will stabilize that empty orbital to a certain degree. You might think, well, wouldn't that break the CH bond? Would you, would you just lose hydrogen or lose a proton? Not exactly. Right? This isn't a reaction. You're not actually fully pushing the electron density from the sp3 bond into the carbocation. Instead, rather than drawing an arrow, which sort of indicates that this is being completely uh, donated, there's sort of this back and forth effect, right? A resonance, a superposition between that bond electron pair and the carbocation. Um, this can only happen if the orbital is properly aligned with the uh, carbocation p orbital. And so what happens is that when you have multiple carbon-carbon bonds next to the cation in question, so let's say that the cation forms at this position here, right, the carbon with the leaving group, when there's only CH bonds here, there is no carbon-carbon bond and therefore no adjacent carbon-hydrogen bond. Right, so this will have no hyperconjugation. Why? Because the CH bonds directly on the, cat, on the cation do not participate in hyperconjugation. So let's say those were hydrogens. Those are not participating in hyperconjugation. I cannot stress this enough. No. Only CH bonds on adjacent carbons do. And so in the case of the primary cation, it would be this species here. That will have some CH bonds, and those CH bonds can participate in hyperconjugation. In the secondary species, we have both of these, and in the tertiary, we have all three of those can participate in hyperconjugative interactions, right? So more adjacent CH bonds leads to increasing hyperconjugation. There's more possibilities for where the hyperconjugation can come from, and as a result, the cation is more stable in the tertiary species here than it is in the secondary, than it is in the primary, and that it is in the methyl cation. Another major thing that we should think about for cation stability is resonance delocalization or resonance donation. We've probably already seen that when we have a carbocation, if it is adjacent to a benzene ring or a pi bond, the electron density in this pi bond can actually go ahead and delocalize and push itself into the carbocation, distributing the positive charge over a larger number of carbons, which is stabilizing. Right? If you can spread out excess charge over multiple atoms, it's more stable than it is on a single atom. So carbocations that are adjacent to a pi system are going to be more stable. As a result, a compound that has a leaving group which is adjacent to a pi system will more readily undergo an SN1 process. So for example, consider this benzyl bromide species here on the, on the right. Although this is a primary leaving group, that is, the carbon with the leaving group only has one other bond other than the leaving group, besides hydrogen, right there, this can, and normally we would think this does not undergo SN1 because primary carbocations are terrible. So, we would think, no, this won't react. But actually, this can go ahead and leave to give you the carbocation. 
Why? Because that carbocation is resonant stabilized by this benzene ring. It can delocalize completely into that ring, right, at the ortho and para positions. And so one resonance structure example would be the following here. And because this is resonant stabilized, the benzyl bromide is actually able to do SN1 reactions. You might wonder, well, how does this compare in terms of rate ability relative to primary, secondary, tertiary species? Well, we already said that primary and methyl do not react. So these species, again, are not participating in SN1 at all. It turns out that a resonance stabilized primary cation, so something that like this benzyl bromide, which is primary but has resonance stabilization, is a little bit better than a secondary cation. Right? It's not quite as good as a tertiary, but it's better than a secondary. Why is it not good as a tertiary? Because it doesn't have the same degree of hyperconjugation. It only has one hydrogen available for hyperconjugation. In terms of the most stable species, that's going to be something that is substituted and adjacent to a pi bond. So something like a tertiary uh, uh, carbon that also has resonance stabilization is going to be the most stable and is going to very strongly favor SN1. That SN1 is going to go very, very fast in those species. In terms of terminology, the way we refer to leaving groups that are adjacent to a pi system, are they are known as allylic. Right, so an allylic leaving group is one that is adjacent to, and I cannot stress this enough, not directly on a double bond. If it's adjacent to a benzene ring, it is known as being benzylic. So this is an example of a benzylic leaving group. It is adjacent to, not directly on a benzene ring. And this is an example of an allylic leaving group. It is adjacent to, but not directly on a double bond. Last but not least, I want to go ahead and talk about negative effects on cation stability, things that actually countermand the stability and the rate of SN1 reactions. This typically happens when you have an electron withdrawing species, something that steals electron density, making the cation even more electron deficient and therefore more unstable. A classic example of this is if you put a bunch of halogens near the cation. Halogens are very strongly inductively withdrawing, and if you have enough of them, you can go ahead and really strongly destabilize that cation. So for example, in this case, we have a trifluoromethyl group adjacent to a tertiary chlorine. The chlorine, you would think, well, it's tertiary, it can leave to give us the cation at this position. However, the inducto effect, right, of these three fluorines, there's a dipole pulling electron density away from that cation, making it very unstable. As a result, this species is not going to be very amenable to an SN1 process, even though it's tertiary. Similarly, you might wonder, why don't the fluorines participate in an SN1 process? We just glossed over them. Well, you can imagine if the inducto effect is strong onto this cation here, at this position, the inducto effect of multiple halogens directly on that carbon is very strong. For this reason, dihalogenated carbons, carbons that have two halogens on the same carbon, you could also say geminal halogens, do not typically participate in nucleophilic substitution reactions, or rather, they do not participate in SN1 reactions. So something like dichloromethane, that looks like this, would also be very unfavorable to have an SN1 process, not just because it's a primary carbocation, but also because it has a chlorine extra destabilizing that uh, carbocation that would form. So you should never try to invoke an SN1 process on a dichloromethane solvent, even if it looks like that might be a possible source of nucleophile. It just, it, it won't be interacting. Right, so again, to summarize, the um, inductive effect leads to an unstable cation and therefore poor SN1. The other thing that can happen is that you could have a resonance effect which puts a positive charge near the cation. So in the case of a carbonyl, carbonyls are electron withdrawing inductively, but they also lead to a resonance dipole, right? One of the resonance structures for the carbonyl is the one shown on the right, where you can imagine the electron density is pulled such that you have now two adjacent positive charges. This is extremely unstable. Again, this unstable cation will now lead to a poor SN1 reaction. So Inductive effects and resonance effects that put positive charges near the cation both lead to inhibited SN1. 
And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.